Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. I hear you just got back from fall break, so hopefully that means you're rested and energetic and intellectually active. We just started our fall break today, which means we're all tired and uh, sort of drove up here from Kansas. But uh, talking about church architecture always fills me uh, with lots of energy. And, you know, many people who are in the field of, of architecture, especially if they have evangelical friends, you know, they have these arguments about what church architecture is. And you'll hear some evangelicals say, I go to a Bible church. And then when you actually see their church, it's not a church, really. It's a factory of some kind or a high school auditorium. And I think Catholics, I mean, Catholics should be saying the same thing. I go to a Bible church, too, because there's a lot of architecture in the Bible. The most kind of interesting high point of the, of the whole architectural image is the apostles are looking at the temple and they're marveling at the stones and the whole question of this will be torn down and raised up in three days and they're speaking of the temple of his body. Right? So Christ's body is equ not equated literally but equated figuratively or sacramentally with a building. And we call our church building the same name that we call this enterprise, so the organism of the mystical body of Christ, is called the church. And sometimes people split those two. The building is not the same as the church, but there's actually a question in Thomas Aquinas where he's asked if it's okay to call the church building the same name as the church, right? The, the calls people the ecclesia. And he said, yes, because the building is such a close analog to the church, the mystical body of Christ, that they should have the same name. And you think about you know, anybody who builds a building knows that truck after truck comes with tiles and all these pieces of you know, flooring and roof shingles and bricks. There are many members that are chaotic, just like the many members of Christ's mystical body are scattered, right? Christ has to gather the tribes and then assemble them into the, the mystical body of Christ. And then when they're assembled, then they praise God. So when you talk about the assembly sitting in the pews in your church up here, you're talking about living stones, as they're called, right? In the temple of God, who are now forming this image of the mystical body of Christ, acting as Christ, praying with Christ as their head, and offering worship to the Father. And so a building has the same thing. Many pieces rightly assembled, and when it's rightly assembled, you start seeing angels and saints and stars and all of creation brought to glory. So there is a high theology of church architecture that's deeply, deeply biblical. You know, one of the things that I've been asked to do is start the Center for Beauty and Culture. If you, it's, it's a mission I and other people have been giving called uh, transforming culture in America. This is Benedictine College's small plan, right? They didn't say come teach three classes, it's like transform culture in America, please, right? So they have a strategic plan. 20 years, five years ago, they said we're going to build new buildings, we're going to get more students, we're going to increase the endowment. They did all that stuff, and then their next 20 years is transform culture in America. So that's what I've been asked to do, and so coming here is part of that, including the Center for Beauty and Culture which my friends in Chicago used to joke was a hair and makeup, right, a beauty culture. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? Beauty has a deep theological definition, and we'll look at that in a second. So I'm going to start with this everyday definition of beauty, and philosophy professors will find this very kindergarten level, but I'll, I'll just work on it here. We call a thing beautiful when it reveals its ontological reality. Yes, sister remembers this from class at the Liturgical Institute. This is what's called the realist tradition or the Aristotelian to mystic tradition, that ontology is the study of being, right? Things that exist share in God's own being. And then once they have existence, they fall into different categories. You know, what kind, what kind of being are they? Is it a human being? Is it a dog? Is it a car? Uh, there's, there are things that start to come up uh, naturally. When we talk about a thing being beautiful, it's when it fully, at least as much as it can on earth, reveals what it is ontologically at the level of its own nature as understood in the mind of God. So what I tell people is just add hyphen N-E-S-S to something and you know you're talking about ontology. What's the dogness of a dog, the carness of a car, the Christness of Christ. If he's not the second person of the Trinity, then he's a bad man, right? So ontologically it really matters. Uh, even our, many of our um, social issues are ontological questions. There's a genetically complete group of cells in the womb of a woman. Is that a person? Is it a blob of cells? That's an ontological definition, and depending on how you settle that ontological question, you then have to know what to do. And so church buildingness actually has what I'll call ontological reality too. So here's your first quiz. You're back from break, so here's your quiz. What is the ontological reality of this? I'm going to move this so it doesn't uh, change your mind so much. Does it, I can actually ask you to vote. Anybody want to vote for Ski Lodge? Okay. <laughs> Museum of Industrial History? Okay. Uh, Catholic Church? 
Yeah, there's always a few people who've seen some Catholic churches that don't look like churches that will say that. Now, I can ask you the same thing about this. Okay, this is a church designed by James McCurry, who was a design architect for this building that we're in, together with Kevin Clark, who's here tonight, local uh, guy. You would probably not think that this was a ski lodge or a museum of industrial history. It's, its churchness is evident in the choices and the materials that the architect has made. And so when you compare these, you don't really have to wonder. The irony is this is from 2009 and this is from 2016. So that's the old church, and this is the new church on the right. And I found that one on the left from the 20, 35 ugliest churches in the world. It was a website thing. And this is number 20, so you can imagine what the first 19 might look like. The guy who wrote it had these quotes, you know, jokes. Optimus Prime goes here, right? If you don't know who Optimus Prime is, that's Optimus Prime. So Optimus Prime's a transformer, he's a truck, he's a robot, he's a, 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 a machine that has human intellect. And these are ontological problems, right? They're kind of fun in a movie, but if your car starts talking to you, that's not a good thing, right? And if it starts shooting you, that's really bad. We like our ontological categories to be very clear. Churches are churches, people are people, cars are cars. So it's not that funny when your church building starts to look like something other than what it is. You know, people say this looks like something from the movie Dune or, you know, various ideas. If your church doesn't look like a church, it'll look like something. And usually people will come up with a name for it that's not very flattering. So, is this a Chiefs fan? No. How do you know? Jeez. He's got a, And it's not even cheese, right? It's a foam that's carved to look like cheese. The levels of absurdity are, you know, I used to live in Chicago, so we have to beat up on Green Bay fans. <laughs> but this invisible reality of Green Bay fan, which in Wisconsin is a spiritual reality, I've been told. <laughs> you don't know, he's walking along, shopping, getting his groceries. He puts this thing on his head and a G on his face, and suddenly matter becomes the exterior realization of an invisible spiritual reality. What am I almost defining right there? Invisible spiritual rea reality being made knowable to the senses through matter. It's almost a sacrament, right? We'll call it a small S sacrament. It's a sacramental thing, again, in uh, Wisconsin. But notice, you don't know who, what his interior reality is until you see that stuff. And so we are, in the Catholic view, positive on creation. Sure, the world has fallen, humanity's fallen, but it's not, goodness is not destroyed, so we can use it to reveal things that are otherwise unknowable. What if this guy is a Chiefs fan? He's confused. He's confused. He lost a bet. Right? It's Halloween. Uh, he's going to the other side to like cause trouble. So notice, we like our exterior realities to match what we know the invisible spiritual reality is. And when you say, that church doesn't look like a church, you might not be saying, oh yes, I'm cataloging ontology of the church in this, and that doesn't match. But actually, we kind of are, intuitively. This is not a Chiefs fan, you just know it right away. But notice it's the exterior stuff that becomes part of the sign value. So if I said which one of these reveals churchness more than the other, left or right, which would you guess? Right, how come? There's a big old cross on it, right? So here's the first uh, lesson of the day. If you need a giant cross on your church so that people know it's a church, it's an admission of failure right away. <laughs> Because if the building looks like a church, you don't have to put a cross on it. I mean, you have a cross on your church. You have several of them. They're little, right? But you, even if they were gone, you would know this was a church. Um, so, uh, you can leave that. You'll, you'll take care of that reminder. Okay. I'll take care of but what does this look like, if you had to guess? They're both churches. If, does this look more churchy even without the giant cross? Yeah. I Me. Mean, it's like a holy mountain. It has some aspiration. It's the architecture itself tells you. This is the famous chapel of the Illinois Institute of Technology by Mies van der Rohe, sort of the famous mid-century modern architect, who thought all buildings were fundamentally factories because we lived in an industrial age, and you had factories for dorming, you had factories for learning, you had factories for eating, you had factories for praying, and they used these industrial materials. Notice the one on the right here, St. Sunbury Novella in Florence, doesn't have a big giant cross on it, and yet the churchness is just kind of coming through there that you know it doesn't need a giant cross because we have this intellectual, mental, and cultural baggage that tells us what churches look like. It doesn't look like the church here. It doesn't look like Shark Cathedral, but somehow churchness manifests through it all. Usually when I ask people what that looks like, somebody will say, well, just give me the great leeway and say Pizza Hut, so that's why I have this slide. <laughs> now, Pizza Hut, next, right? Is this a beautiful Pizza Hut according to our definition? Yes. Yeah. How come? 
it reveals the ontological reality of Pizza Hut. Right? It's hot, shaped, it has red roof, like tomato sauce, and it's got a sign, and it says what it is. So is it a beautiful Pizza Hut? Yeah. Sure. Is it a beautiful church? No. no, right? So things can be beautiful in their own ontological category, just like a beautiful cat is a really bad dog and vice versa, but you need to know what, what they are. So this is how beauty and truth come together, right? Because beauty is the revelation of what's true about something. It's ontological reality is fundamentally what's true about it. So if you're going to assess beauty, you have to know what it is. If you didn't know that it was a Pizza Hut, you might say, no, it's a really bad McDonald's, but it's a pretty good Pizza Hut. So beauty Classically, one of the definitions is the splendor of the truth or the attractive power of the truth. And so beautiful things reveal what they are and make it delightful to um, listen to this or to taste or see. This is why Costco gives free samples every Saturday. You know, you smell those little pizza pockets cooking and the microwave is like, oh, that's attracting me to this, the truth of that you know, uh, hot pocket over there. Now I'm going to take it and delight in it and maybe I'll buy some. So beauty stirs desire. And so this is why beauty has to be used carefully, because if it's desire that for the truth, awesome. If it's desire for something false, then not. And so beauty has a danger as well as a strength. So what we're going to talk about today architecturally is a patristic idea about three periods in salvation history. This comes from the early centuries of the church, a couple of different church fathers, that there are three eras. The first you call the time of shadow. That's the Old Testament, where there are prefiguring, prefiguring types of Christ. You see the shadow of my hand here. You know something about me, but not that much. And the Old Testament has priests and prophets and kings and victims, and it has the temple. There's a really, really central thing. So there's architecture in the Old Testament. The reality is the heavenly future. That's when everything's brought to the fullness of existence and restored uh, to glory. And we're not quite there yet. So we're beyond the time of the shadow, but we're not in heavenly fullness yet. And so what they talk about the time we're in now is the time of the image. And when I say image, it doesn't mean like a picture on the wall necessarily. It's we have access to the things of heaven in the form of sacrament. It's an image, but it's a real image, right? It's a real presence nonetheless. And, and the time will come when we're in heaven, but we're not quite there yet. And this is where liturgy hangs around. You know, Father Mattia, when you go to confession, will say, I forgive your sins, which is kind of scandalous unless you know that he's an image of Christ and a real one, right? So how can you talk to Christ? How can Christ give you counsel? Through the priest and the confessional. How can Christ feed you with his own body and blood through the priest and the liturgical ministers liturgically? And so the architecture is, is very similar to that kind of thing. So church architecture shows the fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is what the catechism says. The church building is a sign of the church living in a place. That's the people of the church. Uh, that God is dwelling with them, and unite, they're united in Christ, and Christ is present there. And you can't miss it. You know, just like, you know, the, the, the state capital is like everywhere. It's like looking over this entire city everywhere you go. <laughs> it's like the government is present in this place. But then you have <laughs> churches that say Christ is present in this place. And then Vatican II, the documents of Vatican II, this is Sacra Sanctum Concilium here, says sacred artists compose the signs and symbols of heavenly realities. It doesn't say factories, it doesn't say living rooms, it doesn't say robots, it doesn't say, you know, industrial forms, signs and symbols of heavenly realities. And then it needs bathrooms and an elevator and parking and all the stuff that, that we need. Fundamentally, though, you know, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and after the fall, they're sent out, you know, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. But where we want to be is where there's no weeping, there's no mourning, there's no sin, there's no sorrow, there's no death. Those are the words from the last book of the Bible that talk about heaven. So this is a mural on the wall behind the altar at Salt Lake City uh, Catholic Cathedral. And this is this vision of heaven. These are the golden walls of the city of heaven. The Trinity is there. The saints are there. The angels of different kinds are there. And then the stars above even are the cosmic dimension of liturgy. Cosmos means creation as well as order. And so the stars are moving in the orbits that God gave them. And by moving the orbits God gave them, they're obeying God and praising God and glorifying God. Not with free will, but with a will that God's given them. And see, the stars here don't look like stars in the sky, you know, in a dark night here. They're like flowers that have been glorified and restored to their heavenly uh, perfection. And so all the chaos, this order of sin, the fallen world, becomes cosmos again, which is the word for order. And we get the word cosmetics from that, by the way. If you talk about cosmetic surgery, it's like, oh, my nose over here. Could you please put it back over there, right? Just put order on my face. Or, uh, you know, put stuff in your hair when you wake up with bed head and put some, you know, order back in your head. Then you come to Mass and you've done your part to restore order to the universe, right? And this is how, how it goes in little ways and big ways. So, 
I can, I'm going to say some stuff that sounds like I'm justifying the great tradition of architecture, and I am. And I'm going to try to place it within the, you know, the modern day theology. Here's the quote from Vatican II, the Mother Church is the friend of the fine arts, because the fine arts can do things that we can't do. Typically, angels don't show up and talk to you, right? Or you don't see them, unless you're a mystic, you, know, you get carried off to visions. Most of us are not. You walk into your chapel up here, you're going to see angels and saints, and you're going to see the vision of heaven. And the arts can do that. They can let you hear the sound of the angels and saints singing around the throne of God, if that's what your choir sounds like. And they should be comp composed of signs and symbols of heavenly reality. So that's what we have to look at. What are signs, what are symbols, and what are heavenly realities? So there's a stop sign. This is near where I used to live in Illinois, a town called Lake Forest. If you know Lake Forest, it's home of billionaires and millionaires and members of the Bears and all the other things <laughs> there, right? So there's a stop sign. Stop signs don't make you stop. They don't make the reality of stopness present. They just suggest to you, please put your foot on the pedal and you stop. And it's red and it's octagonal and it's a convention that we've come up with. When I was in high school, my idiot friends convinced me that stop signs with white lines around them were optional. I don't know if anybody ever did this to you. But all stop signs have white lines around them, so I was, I was for a while, luckily never got a ticket for it. That's because I didn't know the conventions of those signs. Now this is a gas lamp in Lake Forest, which tells you something about Lake Forest, right? It doesn't put out much light, they're very old, they have to pay the gas bill. But old-timiness is something they value. It's like the cheese head of their civic virtues that everybody knows. So that's a sign. And then there's a sign on the sign. It was a sign about signs. There's no parking between signs. So there's like a dense network of signs that we live in. I'm wearing a tie because I think what we're doing here is important. It's a sign that I respect you and this material. If I were here in a swimsuit, that would be a sign that something's not right here and it'd be cold. Right? So like, do we have all these signs? You do things on your wedding day that you don't do other days. So because it's the sign of your wedding day. So can you read these signs here? This is a wall of a school. And there's the cross, and there's the Cardinal Archbishop's coat of arms. Who's the boss in this school? Cardinal. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Jesus. He's the local boss, but who's the head boss? <laughs> you can see if the bishop flipped these around. Uh-oh. Yeah, this is some megalomaniacal behavior here, right? So there's some sign value to this. And if you know how to read coats of arms, the, the color of the hat and the number of knots and all the things that are on that, it's a collection of signs that conveys information. But look at the wall that's behind there. You can see the wide end of a brick is called a stretcher, and the narrow end of a brick is called a header. So there's one, two, three, four, five wide ends, and then a row of narrow. One, two, three, four, five, and then a row of narrow. This is called Five Course American Bond. And brick bonds, the, the arrangement of bricks can be more complex, they can be less complex. You have some crazy brickwork on this building here, right? It's very interesting, different textures, different colors, different shapes. You just don't see buildings with bricks like this very often, unless the building's important enough for it. So it's a sign of the importance of the building. Now the question is, what's a symbol and how can art be a symbol? Well, Eastern Rite churches, Christian churches, often call icons sacraments with a small s, which surprises us Westerners because we think there's seven sacraments, there's definition, instituted by Christ, guarded by the church, dispensed grace, and so on. But there's a broader sense of sacrament, which is anything made of matter that makes active and present an invisible spiritual reality. So Augustine, St. Augustine famously said, the sign of the cross, of the cross was a sacrament. Roman guy's minding his own business, he does this. Now, externally, you know he's a Christian, just like the cheese head. They would, the Eastern people will say, these icons are not earthly portraits. Like, nobody looks like that. That's Santa Claus right there, St. Nicholas. Did you hear they found his grave yesterday? Like, they actually found the real St. Nicholas grave. Nobody, and St. Nicholas didn't look like that, but they're saying, what would heaven look like? What would St. Nicholas look like in heaven? And how do we bring that reality to uh, earth? In other words, all of the experience of fallenness that we have, sin, sorrow, death, disorder, desires, all gone. There's a kind of supreme harmony to their gestures, to their hair, to their clothing. And it uses matter, wood and paint and gold, to make this otherwise invisible reality. It's a saint in glory, um, knowable to the senses. The key thing about a sign is it says, go over there and find something. What's different about a symbol, or this broader definition of a sacrament, is it's rendered present in the room. You see two golden arches, what do you do if you're hungry? <laughs> you go over there and get a hamburger, right? So that's a sign that refers you to hamburgers. The hamburger symbolizes itself, where the sign just points you to the hamburger. So they have a high theology of icons, that this isn't just a reminder 
This isn't just the golden arches of the saints. The saints are now in the room with you. They're, something of their reality is being mediated through the matter itself. And so you have to know who they are. So they have iconography. This, this is a Russian Orthodox saint who's from the Aleutian Islands. Uh, and so he has got this heavy coat on, not because it's cold in heaven, but so that we know who he is. Right? You see Peter with his keys. So this iconography is important. So if we think about architecture as making present these heavenly realities, well, then you have to ask, well, what are the heavenly realities? Remember that book a few years ago, Heaven is for Real? It turned out to be a whole a scam, right? I remember the dad like made it up. Uh, this boy claimed that he had a vision of heaven, and he talked to Mary, and he talked to these people, and they were all like, what's heaven like? What, who did you see? What's like? The people are fascinated. What does heaven look like? We don't have those visions typically. What can you guess by reason? Heaven, ordered or disordered? Ordered, ordered right, because there's no chaos in heaven. Centered on God or centered on someone else? Yeah, not, not too difficult, right? You don't have to be a genius to answer these questions. Empty or populated? Populated, we sure hope so. Well, who do we know is there for sure? The saints, the canonized saints, angels, the yeah, the Trinity, right? So there, there's, this is a place where everything is glorified, ordered, populated, and there, you know, there are saints who are not canonized saints, you know, people in heaven that are not declared. Um, perfected, yes, not flawed. Radiant, yes, not dull. When you start thinking about a church that looks like a church, you might say, oh yeah, if it's not, if it's not ordered, if it's not centered on the action of the altar, if it's not populated with images of angels and saints, if it's not radiant with color and imagery, then there's something kind of lifeless about it because it's not sacramentalizing what heaven would be. So here's a mural on the, the front wall you know, behind the altar of the Cathedral in Toledo, Ohio. It's Our Lady of the Rosary, so you see the three persons of the Trinity putting the crown on the Virgin Mary. And there's this opening in the sky from through which heaven is bursting into our realm, and there are rainbows that are a sign of the covenant and right relationship between God and humanity. And so all this stuff here that was dirt, I mean, these pigments were just minerals in the ground, and somebody dug them up, and the artist used matter to reveal these heavenly realities. You start to see how art falls in the sacramental uh, realm. This is one of my three favorite ologies. I have three of them, but eschatology is one of them. Eschaton is the end times, and people usually get scared when they hear about the end times. It's like angry Jesus with lightning bolts and wounds of blood and horsemen of the apocalypse and stuff like that. That's not the end times. That's the birth pains of the end times. The end times are when there's no trace of the fall left. No sin, no sorrow, no death. So the eschaton is really the time after the fall is gone. And so what you're seeing here is the vision that we hope to have in heaven, but we're having it by way of foretaste. That's why it's called anticipated. Vatican II speaks very specifically about the foretaste of the heavenly Jerusalem, and you don't have that foretaste visually unless you make it present. So we're going to look at a couple of buildings from uh, Scripture here. One is the synagogue. You hear about those all the time. The synagogue, just from the Greek word, means to lead people together. Anytime you hear agog on a word like demagogue or pedagogue or pedagogy if you're a teacher, it's about leading. It's that Greek word, again. And so people will come together for talking about scripture. It's a place for the spoken word. But it was a consecrated place used exclusively for prayer. So this was not your Knights of Columbus Hall where you had your Bible study. This was a very significant place. They'd be oriented toward Jerusalem, and you hear about Christ preaching and reading in the synagogue. And they had a little ark here. You see this little niche here where they would put the, the Torah, the scrolls of the Torah in there. And if you go to a synagogue, I grew up in New York, so I went to lots of bar mitzvahs as a, as a kid. And they would still process in with the scrolls and put the Torah in the ark there in the synagogue. And it had a reader's platform called the Bima, which they think became what we now call the Anvil, and an empty chair called the Seat of Moses. Now, this is mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament. You, they like to sit on the Seat of Moses. It's a place of authority of teaching. And Moses is long dead, of course, but they have this empty chair where the living tradition is carried on from one generation to the next. Can you think of anything you've ever seen where a chair that's probably empty most of the time is a sign of the living tradition of the faith being handed on from one generation to the next? The bishop's chair. The bishop's chair, yeah, the cathedra. Mm -hmm. cathedra. If you have a cathedral, that's we use it as a noun, but it's actually an adjective, cathedral church. It's the church that has the bishop's chair in it. Just as the apostles hand on the faith from one generation to the next, the chair signifies that teaching authority and governing authority. And so you might say, chair, oh, it's easy enough to sit in when you need to sit, but it's a lot more than that, and it's present in the synagogue. So there are some synagogue ruins left. This is in Capernaum, right near the Sea of Galilee. These are pretty significant buildings. You know, when Christ was uh, walking around, 
Jerusalem was part of the Roman Empire. And you, know, you see the Easter specials and you think everybody was living in huts and walking around in rags. It was a serious city. Marble columns, the Temple Mount was quite famous. And so the ruins of the, the synagogue uh, still tell you these were important buildings. And there's some details that you can see. This is from the first uh, synagogue down there. This Corinthian capitals that come right out of the Roman tradition, of which you have several on the outside of your, of your church here. And they put a menorah up there to say, okay, even though we've been swamped by the culture of the Roman Empire, we're going to still hold on to our Judaism. You know, the Jews and the Romans are always at each other's throats for all kinds of reasons. Um, and then different symbols from the, the Jewish tradition of the vine and the Star of David and so on. So serious architecture in the time of Christ. The most serious architecture, though, is the Temple Mount. And you can go to the Temple Mount today. It's a Muslim shrine up there called the Dome of the Rock. Now, this is a place of animal sacrifice. Just to give you a sense of the scale, like these are people's houses down here. These columns here are at the height of a three-story building. <coughs> one. So they're the height of you know, your, your church here. And there are 256 of them. They're all limestone. They're all cut. They're all brought from a quarry far away. This is a big deal. The people would come to Jerusalem and say, even the, the forums of Rome were not as nice as what Herod built here on uh, the Temple Mount. And, but the temple itself was this little building right here. There was a room in the back, which was where God dwelled with creation. Huge descriptions <laughs> in the Old Testament of kings and chronicles of what you make the temple out of, this many cubits high and this wide. Very, very specific and direct instructions on how to do all this stuff. And of course, the, the Acts of the Apostles talks about them going back there after the uh, ascension, and they speak about certain places. And so the temple's a really important thing. Now there's a phrase that I learned from Yves Congar here, and his book came out right at the time of Vatican II, called The Mystery of the Temple. The presence of God is holy and confers holiness. Now there's not too many sentences you hear in your life that have changed your view of things, but think of that for a second. The presence of God is an active and dynamic principle. Sometimes I'll tell people it's like the microwave of holiness. You know, someone puts you in a microwave and turn it on. You're cooked. That's like how it works. The presence of God is this active, dynamic, transformative principle. And the presence of God was in that building right there in the Ark of the Covenant. We still talk about, I mean, on the Ark of the Covenant, we still talk about real presence all the time and being Christ's presence to each other. It's an active and dynamic principle. So when you look at this, this is a big, big deal for the Israelites. When they worship the golden calf, God's presence leaves the temple. You know, Elvis leaves the building, so to speak. And then they get defeated by their enemies, right? This is what they want. There's no thing they want more than to worship properly and have the presence of God come back. And so they finally build this proper temple, and then they do the right ceremonies of consecration, which we still do when we dedicate a church, and then God's presence dwells there again. It's a big deal in the Old Testament, and it's architecture. This is the Kidron Valley down here, which maybe you've heard of Christ coming in, um, we call Palm Sunday, coming in the, the door of the Golden Gate, which was only to be opened when uh, the Messiah came. So this all this stuff that's very wrapped up in the temple. Of course, the question is, what's a temple? We sort of know, but it reveals a sacred reality, pretty basic. But it's the dwelling place of the deity. The Temple of Solomon was a temple to God's name, strangely enough. There was no statue of God the Father in the, in the back of it. So his name signified his authority and his presence. So if I put Bishop Conley on my name tag, you'd probably think, well, is it a joke? Are you crazy? Are you, are you really claiming his authority? There are people who claim that, you know, when the priest um, bends over at Mass to um, say the words of consecration, that this actually comes from the tradition that if you were the messenger of the king, you wouldn't come in and say, I want to declare war on you because then the messenger would be claiming it. He would bend over and say, the king says, I want to declare war on you. So bending over means you're saying the words of somebody else, but you're making them real. And so that kind of using the name of somebody is a really important not a thing. Orientation of time. To go in the temple is to leave time. You don't know if it's day or night. You don't know if it's summer or winter. You don't know if the world has fallen or not. There's this victory in time over chaos, and it's a place of cosmic symbolism. Leaves, buds, flowers, angels, saints, and stars. So the whole of creation is shrunken down to a little room, which of course is what happened in Christ, right? The Gerard Manley Hopkins said at the Incarnation, infinity dwindled to infancy. Christ took all creation on himself, and they talk about the womb of the Virgin Mary as containing the whole universe. It's kind of an amazing thought. And so a temple is like that too, and you can see churches do that. This is a before and after on the church uh, renovated by an Archbishop Duncan Strode. It was a pretty nice late 19th century church, 
Most people will probably be pleased enough to go there. But this got beigeified sometime in the 70s. And then when they fixed it up, notice they painted the ceiling the sky color, and the stars are up there, so the cosmic reality is being added, and the saints are added, and then this gold leaf uh, is starting to make it shimmer like it's got heavenly glory. So it's really learning the lessons of the temple. Here it is, though, again. If you go to Jerusalem now, this area here is called the Wailing Wall. That arch still exists. You can go in there, and there's all kinds of scholars in there praying and talking. And then this wall is still uh, there on this side, too. All the stuff at the top has been destroyed. But this is the temple building itself. We spend a lot of time on it because it's really important. The altar was out here. It's where the animal sacrifices were burned. There were two hollow bronze columns. A big room in there and a little room in the back called the Holy of Holies. And on these walls were carved cedar panels of leaves and flowers and vegetables and then trees and then all covered in gold. So what does it sound like? It's an architectural rendition of? Garden. The garden. What have Adam and Eve been kicked out of, so to speak? The garden. What's humanity invited back into? The new garden of the glorified world. And that's why it's all covered up in gold. And then in the back was a little room called the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant in it. It was the golden box. If you've seen the movie The Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's the Ark, the same Ark that they were looking for. Has anybody ever seen the original Raiders of the Lost Ark? I know you're probably too young, but maybe you've seen it. You know, at the end, they actually take the, the Ark and then they take the lid off and then the, you know, the power of God comes out and the Nazi guy's face melts and his eyeball rolls away. And I thought that was so cool when I was a kid. You can't like lasso God to win you know, you know, World War II. But the point is, the power of God was dwelling in this room, and it was 20 cubits wide by 20 cubits high by 20 cubits deep. And the cubit was the length of the forearm. So we speak about feet, but they spoke about forearm. So what shape is the Holy of Holies? It's 20 by 20 by 20, so it's a cube, right? Square and plan. And to get in there, there's a big curtain that uh, called the veil. And so this was the architectural rendition of heaven. This was the architectural rendition of earth. And heaven and earth are separated by this big curtain. What happens to the curtain when Christ dies on the cross? It is torn, the scripture says, from top to bottom, meaning God tears it. So the thing that was blocking your access to heaven is now not there anymore. The thing that was blocking the glory of heaven flowing into earth is at least is not there, or at least it's torn, it's still there in part. And so the high priest would go among the priests here and step through there once a year and bring the prayers and petitions and the sacrifices of blood and grain into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. So remember, the presence of God is what? And confers what? Holy and confers holiness. Yes. So if they brought blood in there, in the presence of God, it would have holiness conferred upon it, and then they would sprinkle that blood on the people. And that was one way that people received the holiness of God carried by blood. This is the prefiguring. It's a little hard to see here, but there's also little tables here with round loaves of bread. They were called the show bread or the face bread. They were actually brought into the Holy of Holies too. Round loaves of bread. And if they went into the Holy of Holies, they became bearers of that presence too. And the priests would eat them on the Sabbath. And so there's a, another story of the Eucharist that's not just the Last Supper narrative, but also the temple tradition as well. And if you got through there, you'd see this golden box with an angel on each side. Sometimes they show it with a little spark of God's presence in the middle. It was God's presence abiding with his people. So maybe, have you ever seen the golden box where God's presence abides with his people with an angel on each side? This is tabernacle. I'm glad you guys aren't child here. Right? So, no, God is not limited to a golden box and our altars because we receive that presence. We take it out to the world and we make disciples of all nations. But he didn't destroy the Old Testament um, shadowy thing. And so what we have here is a high priest that wore a bunch of funny stuff. Now, I don't know, Bishop Conley, if you ever get to do this real high ceremonies anymore of all the old extraordinary form vestments and everything, but there's a lot of stuff a bishop wears, a lot of like, amazing and slightly crazy <laughs> layers of stuff. The high priest, now fulfilled by a bishop, um, wears a lot of vestments, and let's put them all here, right? He had a nameplate on his head that said Yahweh on it, so he was the Lord. Remember, if you wear the nameplate, that's who you are. There were 12 gems on the <coughs> plate, each one with the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So stones are people, because they have their names on them. Start thinking, oh, you are living stones in the temple of God. You are members of that mystical body. That temple is the, the temple of Christ's body. And then he had these garments and these things that represented all of creation. And then the sun and the moon were represented by these stones. So who's the high priest? He's this prefiguring of Christ. He takes all of creation on himself. He takes all of humanity on himself. And then what does he do with them? 
He brings them into the Holy of Holies. But what happens when they're brought into the presence of God? They're made holy. Right? So what does Christ do? He takes all creation on himself. He comes to earth, he walks through earth, he takes all the creation back to the Father. And then he turns around in the life of the church and distributes those graces to us. It's all right here. If you don't know a temple, and you just think a church is the living room of God, then it's going to look domestic. Once you know your temple stuff, then it's not just, I like old things, it's, yeah, I get it, this building is a microcosm of, of all of creation. And you see the stuff we use to make it. We believe in the goodness of creation. Stone, glass, steel, wood. Even rayon in the 1950s, people wrote these letters to Rome saying, may we use rayon for vestments because the silk gets eaten by worms. And stuff. So they got permission to use rayon because it was heavenly. And what's the authority? Well, the Old Testament, basically, it was like, do this because I'm God. In the New Testament, there are two important moments. If you're going to go home for Thanksgiving and argue with your evangelical uncle or your angry whatever cousin, since <laughs> you Catholics don't know the Bible, keep these in your, in your holsters. In the Incarnation, matter reveals God. God, unknowable, far away, insensible, intangible, immaterial, and then Christ takes on carbon and water and calcium and all the things we're made of and says, he who sees me sees the Father. That's kind of an amazing thing. And if you don't think creation is good, then you don't believe that. And a lot of Protestants have a different theology of what creation's goodness is. The transfiguration of the hand takes it up a notch, right? Not only does Christ's body reveal God, but he goes up to Mount Tabor, and his body becomes dazzlingly white, radiant with heavenly glory, even still on this earth. So what we can learn from that is sacred images made of matter can reveal God. Buildings made of stuff can reveal the glory of heaven, not just the reality of heaven, but the glory of heaven as well. So this is deeply biblical stuff. And I, you know, I was studying this temple stuff a number of years ago, and I grew up in New York, and I've been to St. Patrick's Cathedral a number of times, and I was like, oh, I'm pretty building, you know. And then I started reading the church as a temple, and the temple is a microcosm of all creation. And I looked at this with new eyes, and I'm like, here's the Paschal candlestick, and it's got leaves and flowers and buds on it, and here's the canopy of the altar. And if you look at it clearly, there's the lilies coming up here. There are these columns that come up with capitals on the top made of leaves. And I had read somewhere that the 19th century historians had said these ribs that come up are like the, the branches of trees. And I thought they were just like, you know, decadent opium smoking 19th century historians making, making this stuff up. <laughs> But then I went up to Central Park, you know, it's a few blocks from there. It's like, oh yeah, here's the famous alley of elm trees where the branches come up and form this canopy. And even with all the arborists they have, they're still chaotic and wiggly and wonky where everything's brought to perfection over on this side. And you start looking around and you're like, oh, that's the other side of the pulpit. Leaves, buds, flowers, angels, saints. There's some statues there. Here's the railing that goes up there. Is that architecture? Or is it a garden? Because the architecture flowers into these leaves. And there's the underside of the Paschal candlestick with figures. Here's a communion rail with leaves, buds, flowers. Here's the end of the pew with flowers on top. It's not that hard. If you're seeing the church building is this image of the new heaven and the new earth, then you start looking around and you see it everywhere. Tops of columns, radiator covers, and wrought iron, more leaves there. Uh, the stage was the cross decorated with flowers. This is the evidence of the world coming back to the glory that it's supposed to have. So, you know, when we build churches, we look around, and you see it here in your own town. Um, you're, anybody here remember your old Newman Center church? Yeah? <laughs> when someone would walk by and say, oh my gosh, heaven has come to earth. Maybe if they looked, the Father would say, no. <laughs> you better say no since you've been torn down. <laughs> but what does it mean? Christ is reconciled with humanity. In other words, the this, this separation that comes from the fall is gone, and Christ is present. You can see that in places like Rome. That's a church, and that's a house, and they look very different. This is in Chicago, St. Paul's in Pilsen. That's obviously a church, and that's obviously a house. The domestic things have domestic character, and the church things have ecclesiastical character. And when you get closer, you start to see they're made of lots of little parts. <coughs> And there's a beautiful study, if you ever want to do this, look at the prayers for the rite of dedication of a church. The actual prayers themselves contain lots of theology. And one of the prayers at the laying of the, the marking out of the place of where the church will be built is that all those present as living stones can be hewn and dressed by God's hand. So like you come out of the womb, you know, and you're kind of wonky, and you don't care about anybody except your diaper and your hunger and you're scared, right? Little by little, you grow up and mom says, eat your vegetables, do your homework, don't eat your sister, go to confession, you know, do whatever. And you start to get shaped by the people in your life. And then, if you're a Christian, you get assembled into this building, which is the body of Christ. 
So that's Uncle Harry, and that's Aunt Martha, and that's Pope Pius X. And, you know, some people are more prominent, and, you know, and some people are elderly shut-ins or cloistered nuns who pray for us, and we don't know who they are. You see how the building signifies all of this. When it gets to glorious things, mosaics, little tiny pieces, one of them means nothing. You assemble enough of them, and the face of Christ appears. Or you make the streets of heaven inside the floor of a church. Or you drink out of the chalice, which is the cup of heaven. What would the, what would the banqueting cup of the heavenly feast really look like? Uh, this is a, a newish altar, a couple of years old now, where they actually made the front out of pieces of different colored marble to signify the membership of the mystical body, to evoke the gems of the high priest breastplate, and then to show them in this kind of perfect movement of, of the cosmos as God established things. So an altar can be a lot of things, if it's thought through seriously. Um, traditional architecture, architecture that we think is fitting, also has a lot of stuff on it. This is what I call ornament. Uh, ornament is something added to a building that indicates festivity or reveals purpose or function. And you look around and you see angels and shields and masks and hanging <coughs> plants and flowers. This one here is called an egg and dart molding. That's the egg shell, that's the yolk inside. So the egg's been opened to show you the new life inside. It's also wearing a necklace here that runs across here. It's called a bead and reel. Uh, here's another egg and dart. This is a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel, and this ornament is telling you Christ is present in the garden of the world in the form of the Blessed Sacrament, right? It doesn't have to have words on it to communicate that knowledge. So, what's happening these days and all of these pictures? Wedding. Wedding. You were there? You know that couple? You were there that day? My besties. They're your besties? Okay. I don't know who they are, but I've been using their picture about 10 years ago. If, any, if, there's, if there's any level of fame that comes from talks that I give, they have it now. <laughs> but notice, this is the cheese head of the wedding day. You know he's a Green Bay fan because the cheese head. You know it's wedding because there's stuff there. These little roses were growing happily in the garden and somebody ripped their little heads off and sprinkled them on the ground. There's an excess. There's a kind of waste to festivity. And I don't you know. These people are having a great day, right? There's a watermelon wearing a sombrero. And that's a, a honeydew that's like a swan. And they have a palm tree right out of the Temple of Solomon right there. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. They have to work the, the desert for the sweat of their brow to eat. What happens on your wedding day? Food is just like falling off the table, right? And it's, it's so, you can have fun with it. There's so much of it. And so wedding, fullness, existence, festivity, these are all things associated with ornament. And so when a church has ornament, it's not just because we like old things. It's because we're celebrating ritual festivity. You know, there's a lot of talk about columns in scripture too. Uh, Psalm 144 comes up pretty regularly in the Liturgy of the Hours. May your daughters be graceful as columns, okay, but adorned for a palace. And so this column here has a necklace here, and it has a, some beads in her hair. This one has flowers in her little hairdo there. And so we do something in the Western tradition when we're indicating festivity. It's very complicated. You have to concentrate on this. When you want to indicate ritual festivity, you hang stuff on stuff. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Halloween's coming up. What are we going to do to the house? Hang stuff on stuff. Your roommate's birthday party, streamers, and the ceiling. Fire on cake. Isn't that weird that we take fire and put it on food, and we put it in front of a two-year-old and sing happy birthday? It's, like, it's weird, right? But this is how festivity happens. Christmas is a nice tree, and we cut it off and put it in the living room and hang things on it. It's weird, right? But this is how, how it works. One of the other things about this end times, this eschatological condition, is everything is graceful and light and easy. Ballet dancing is very, very hard work, but it looks effortless. It looks graceful. You know, the feet are up like this because it changes the proportions of a, of a body. I'm not aware of high heels. Maybe somebody here in this room is. Why do women like to wear high heels? Because suddenly they get five extra inches, and the ratio of their width to their height changes, and they look slimmer all the way from head to toe, even though they're only four inches tall. That's what happens in ballet. Effortless, see how architecture can do that too? When there's an effortless, particular kind of way that all these pieces come together. Modern architecture tends to like to thud things together. <laughs> Big concrete pole, hold up, steel beam, right? Where this will say, this is like eloquence in Latin, right? How do you use that uh, way to speak of how forces come together? Now this wedding stuff, I'm not making this up, right? This is the last book of the Bible. St. John has this vision, and he sees the new Jerusalem, the new city, coming down from heaven, uh, from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And the bride, of course, is the church, it's all of us who are separated from God at the fall to some degree, 
and then Christ unites us. This is why we talk about the wedding feast of the liturgy. It's the two were separated to become one. And brides are adorned and festive and ornamented, and so are our churches, and properly ornamented churches anyway. So I love this one, because if you were the groom and your bride is at the end of the aisle like this, this is not a good day for you, right? <laughs> but you don't know what day it is until she does this, right? So at least you know more now. <laughs> but this is a church, right? This is a 2008 church in Spain, all poured concrete. There's steel in there, so it's not going to fall down, but it looks like it might. And everything's slanted, everything's an angle. They're using material that's the lowest in the hierarchy of materials, or at least low in the hierarchy. We make curves and uh, parking lots out of it, and then we make churches out of it. And then the inside, this is before it was all finished, but you see this kind of gash in the wall. It's like a dangerous, threatening cross. No color, no ornament, no gem-like radiance, no garden. No trinity, no saints. So I'm, well, is this where you want to be? You know, for eternity? I don't know. I'd, I'd probably turn that offer down if I had uh, if I had the chance. <laughs> so we'll round up uh, with this. What does heaven look like? Typically, through history, people look to the Book of Revelation because Saint John has a vision of heaven. There are different visions of heaven. Ezekiel has some, and others have them. And here is the quote: He sees a tear in the sky. So that should think, make you think of what? He looks up in the sky, and there's a tear in the sky. He's looking through the veil, right, from the earth to heaven, like the temple, and he sees a throne with one seated on the throne and a rainbow that looks like an emerald. It's a rainbow again, right, relationship between God and humanity all the way back to Noah. But it looks like an emerald. Now it's like a gem-like, glorious rainbow. There are all these people dressed in white robes, which is typically the dress of heaven, and then these funny winged creatures uh, that are the four evangelists. And then who else was there? Great multitudes that no one could count from every nation, not just Israel, from all the tribes, northern tribes, southern tribes, and they're all standing before the throne and the Lamb, and they're all singing, holy, holy, holy. And then they get a tour of heaven. This is a great thing. I always tell people, you know, this is an architect's dream. You want to build heaven? How do you know what it's like? Well, an angel gives them a tour, and they have a golden measuring rod, and they find out that the city is width and its height and its depth are all the same. So heaven is a cube. What was the image of heaven in the temple? Also a cube. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that heaven is literally a cube. But what it means is that this prefiguring in the temple is fulfilled in the temple of heaven. And then they see heaven, uh, the walls, and look what it's made of. Twelve uh, gems of different kinds that correspond to the gems of the high priest's uh, breastplate. So here they are, with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. You know, Israel was a person that called sons. And the, the tribes were led by the sons, and they had different names, Reuben and so on. And so they couldn't all be brought into the Holy of Holies because it was too small. So they were represented by stones vicariously, and then the Jews represented all of humanity. So they're brought in there. And people try to figure out which uh, apostle corresponds to which tribe. Nobody really knows. And what are you doing doing this over here? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, right? The key idea is there are 12 people of the, of the um, people of God preparing the world for the fulfillment of the twelve apostles, and they're going to go out to the world and make disciples of all nations. So the gem is a really important thing. If you're interested in Bible study, just look up words like emerald, uh, chrysophrase, these funny gems, we don't even know what they mean anymore, diamond, ruby, sapphire, and you'll see they're all through scripture. And carbon and a diamond are pretty much chemically the same thing. I mean, this is a, a lattice, crystalline structure, and so on, but you find a diamond in the ground, it doesn't look like much. You have to cut it, and you polish it, and you have this kind of internal reflection, they call it. That's why diamonds are interesting to look at, because they have total internal reflection. The light comes in and it bounces around inside. And so this is an image of the saint who's living the grace of Christ that's lighting us up. And if you've ever met a holy person and you just see the light in their eyes, and it's like you have to put sunglasses on, it's like too holy for, for me. Um, this is the same idea. So nature plus grace is symbolized by a gem. This is what rubies look like before they become rubies. So stones are people, glorified stones are gems, glorified people are, are um, saints, and those saints are assembled into the midst of the body in the way that stones are assembled into a church. So that's what the church building is, an image of saints assembled under the headship of Christ. Think about that when you look at stained glass. You say, okay, well, it looks like the walls are made of gems. Here's somebody's vision of the heavenly Jerusalem, where the walls are actually made of gems. There's St. John, it's a little hard to see because it's dark, but with the an angel, and there's the measuring rod, and this is the garden that's inside. This is the vision of our heavenly future. So um, you might say, does this mean every church has to look the same? 
And we'll, we'll round out now, just swoop into the end, starting with this quote. Paul Dokumov is a well-known theologian of icons, and he said, it's totally legitimate to search for new forms in architecture. You know, we may know things we didn't know 500 years ago, but they all have a heavenly origin. The idea is, no matter what it is, how many different kinds of cheese heads you have, as many as you can have, if it starts being something else, then it's not Green Bay anymore, right? <laughs> heaven, how many ways are there to render heaven? As many as you can render, if you listen to the angel of the temple. So it's changing and unchanging all the time. Can you start to see how this is a biblical vision here at St. Paul, outside the walls in Rome? This will be your final exam. We started with a quiz, that was the final exam. How is this not just like some creative artist? Why is this a biblical vision? What does St. John see? A throne, and one seated on the throne, right? Here it is, and there are saints around there, there are palm trees <coughs> over there, uh, there are plants around here. When we get a close-up of the throne, you'll see it's like part gems and part leaves. See this little guy down here in white, I'll do a detail of him, that's uh, Pope Honorius III, who uh, put this mosaic in the church, there's his name. So that's a perfected, glorified eschatological toe right there, you know, what does Christ's toe look like? But look at the throne. There's a sapphire and an emerald and pearls. And why are pearls an image? You know where a pearl comes from. It's an oyster. But how does it get started? There's this little bit of dirt. This irritating bit of dirt. And then it gets covered in this glorious stuff. Well, who's made of the dust of the earth? In the beginning of things. Adam, right? And Eve and us. And so we are brought to glory. And so the pearly gates speak about the transformation from merely earthly to glorious. And then there's leaves and flowers and all kinds of stuff. It's this vision of heaven and made of all these little tiny pieces that then form the image of Christ. The Saint Chapelle in Paris made of stained glass, the walls we know, but what does it look like it might be made of? Gems, yeah, it's a big break, right? This, these look like walls made of sapphires or rubies or whatever. Now, we can't make buildings out of rubies. It's too expensive and people would steal them and become some problem. But you can approximate those, right? There are also these columns that run up here. You can maybe see the stars in the ceiling. Uh, can you guess how many there are? Twelve. Twelve, right. There are certain places in you know, town today, but in Scripture, where people are compared to columns. Anybody know what the top of a column is called? A capital. Can you do a quick word origin on that? Should be decapitated, right? It's a head. Okay. So columns have heads. They also have pedestals, from the Latin word pedestrian, pes, is a foot. And so you have 12 columns that represent 12 pillars of the church, and they hold up the roof, just like people who support a church hold up the church. And then what are they? Glorified, heavenly, cosmic, and all of that. Sometimes it's more literal. Christ seated on the throne, surrounded by saints and angels. This is the floor in front of the altar in that cathedral in West Virginia made of little pieces of tile and little pieces of stone. Um, what does it look like they're trying to symbolize? If this were the cheese head, what's the cheese head that's going on here? The streets are made of? Stone. Stones, living stones, glorified stones, or gems, right? So these are pieces of tile and stone. These are leftover pieces from um, another guy's job. They didn't have much money, but they managed to pull it off uh, anyway, nonetheless. So the streets of heaven are gem-like and radiant. Uh, this was a mural in a fairly new church in 2008 in um, Kansas. The same vision was brought up, Christ on the throne, the angels, the saints. There's the all-seeing eye of God the Father, which makes people think it's a free Masonic plot by the pastor. You might be careful when you uh, do that. And then the river of water of life is the Holy Spirit, and then saints from different places, uh, different American saints. It can be pretty modern, too. I get a lot of church pictures from wedding websites, as you can see. I don't know these people, but look at this stunning church. This is on the, the bride's website. The church in 1960, I call this Jetsons Catholic. because It's kind of space age. But here you can see there's an angel and it's saying Sanctus. It's angel, 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 Sanctus, 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 Sanctus. So this is an image of heaven in a very modern way, but it's doing the same thing. Or a newish church, a La Brue is a monastery in France, where they have noble simplicity, truly monastic simplicity, except in their sanctuary, see, it moves up from plain floor to enriched floor because this is moving from the temple to the Holy of Holies, and then there's an image of the angels on the ceiling there. So you can do these kind of hierarchical things according to a theological logic. So, you know, here's your church, right? And this is one, an early version of it when the tower was on the inside of the courtyard, it's moved to the outside. But see how it's holding the corner here? 
Uh, the architects, the design architects website I read, and you know we have someone here who worked on it, Kevin Clark, who may know a lot of these details too, said that at, um, Lincoln is known for its towers. Important buildings in this town have towers. It's the state capitol, which was the first skyscraper of U.S. capitol, by the way. Everybody uh, wanted state capitol. I mean, everybody wanted domes like the U.S. capitol. And then in 1924, they're like, "This is the modern age. We're going to make a skyscraper capitol. It'll be like the internet capitol for us." You know, that was a sign of modernity. <clears throat> to hold this corner, right? Until there's a tower. There's another tower. And so there it is. Right? I'm sure you, you know. Don't you know better than I do? Here are some of those Corinthian columns we were talking about over here and over here. And you can see the church clearly looks like a church. The other parts don't look quite as churchy, but still ecclesiastical. I don't know if anybody knows the numbers of what a tower, this tower actually costs, right? This completely unnecessary thing. You, know, you need bathrooms, you need classrooms, you need an altar. You don't really need a tower. It's probably a significant chunk of the budget, but you have to ask the question, well, what is the value of proclaiming Christ across the landscape and people seeing this and finding it and following it. Um, I found this quote from um, one of the architects' website, and he said it was an urban site, it was pretty tight, and they wanted to harmonize with the context while being an identifiable Catholic building in the university. They used a massing, it's kind of a cruciform plan. You see, cruciform means a cross shape. They didn't have a big, giant amount of room to do it, so it's a very tiny little cross shape plan with a drum and then a bell tower that is visible from a distance and forms a part of the skyline. That's what Lincoln does with its um, tower. There's the old Newton Center, by the way, because mm -hmm. um, students you know, come and go, and maybe you, know, you haven't been here long enough to, to see it. You, know, you recognize it as a church, but no one would say, oh my gosh, there's Heavenly Jerusalem. Oh my gosh, that's so eschatological. You know, people get attached to things that they love, and I'm not trying to beat it up. But you kind of have to be objective about its, its sign value. If this were a Green Bay fan, would this be a big old cheese head? Probably not so much. It'd be like a little pin, you know? And that's good, right? But you know, somebody thought it could be better. And so you start to see it from different angles, and its ecclesiastical quality is obvious. Maybe you see all these bricks of different colors. You have a church around the corner, not too far away, called the First Plymouth Church. Heron, Harold Van Buren McGonagall is this great name. He was a New York architect who built this church and used these bricks of, of different colors. It's kind of the Lincoln uh, way. Um, I remember talking with one of the architects about this as an inspiration. Not just because they use bricks of different colors, but you can see how it brings out the pieceness of the walls. All the stones are assembled, some are different colors, different textures, different shapes. And this is that, that church. And they particularly use colors from Nebraska's um, landscape, so they said. But when by having these differences, big bricks, little bricks, bricks turned up, bricks of different colors, it starts to bring out the assembled nature of the many pieces. And you can see that in your uh, church here. Some of them are square, some of them are dark, some of them have texture. It's very hard to pick a, an arrangement of bricks that doesn't look uh, ridiculous when you only see a little plot, you know, a little bit of it. It's a real difficult challenge. Uh, here's the plan of the place, as you know. Here's the front door, and you come in, you have this kind of choice. Go to church, go to this side over here, and there's a little chapel-like room with these columns, and then a, a baptismal chapel or overflow seating, and then the church this way, and then you know the Marian chapel uh, over there. So there's an intentional move there. Remember, columns are people. They have heads and feet. And this particular kind of uh, column is called the Doric, traditionally represented men in the history of architecture for various reasons. So it's creating a room within a room. So think of these as saints. You know, hey, I'm processing. There's a, uh, a the base of a column comes from the Greek word basis, which was, actually means foot in Greek, but it also means a processional dance. So if you've ever done the electric slide at a wedding, uh -huh. uh, there was another dance called the basis. And when they were going up the temples in ancient Greece, they would process with these swaying movements. And that was called the basis. So these aren't just columns. That's people. There. These are people who are doing the liturgical dance. And I don't mean like people jumping around in leotards, liturgical dance. We're talking about serious architectural procession from one place up to the other. And then, of course, you know the view there. Everything focuses on, on that end. But there's also this enrichment all over the place. You can start to say it's colorful, it's radiant, it's floral, and it's inspiration, it's geometric. It's filled with figures, uh, because these are members of the same worshiping assembly. When things come down, they land on something. Here's a column that supports the, uh, the arches. This arch comes down and it lands on a bracket that supports it. This is clarity of structure. And you see it here too, these big piers with their enrichment and everything that is supported is supported by something. This is one of the things that makes traditional architecture look traditional. 
And then the sanctuary, this is your Holy of Holies. Right? It's, it bumps up in this enrichment of pattern and color. Uh, you know, it's sort of a sub subdued uh, palette. But you can imagine these being different gem-like pieces of stone. And then the altar is enriched with paint. And then these patterns, um, I don't know exactly the history of those, but they're suggesting something important in ecclesiastical is here. And of course, you know the view up to the, the dome. Um, there's a view to this, the cosmos of the starry skies. And at the center of all is this monogram of Christ. Here's a painting from the painting company, Evergreen Studios in New York, when they were actually doing it to get a sense of, of the scale of how big uh, that really is. And then some of the other murals they were uh, doing with the stars and the symbols around your church. These are big things when they're 30 feet in the air. It's hard to get a sense of that. Now you might just say, well, it looks like old-fashioned churchy stuff. That's pre-Vatican II and therefore stupid. Or you could say, that's pre-Vatican II and therefore awesome. Right? Notice, this is not a chronological argument. This is an ontological argument. The stars are members of the worshiping assembly in their way, and so they belong there to remind us of their presence. And they're given this kind of geometric precision. You can see the chalk lines there. The order is restored to the cosmos. And of course, if you view back there, you see these different enrichments. Here's another detail of the guy installing them. They're pretty uh, darn uh, big. You have these notions of intertwined things, so the movement of things in perfect order, inside and out, and the movement of the stars symbolized by these little swirls. It's a theological thing, but also makes it interesting to look at. Now, I know you know your big window. I don't know, is this the biggest stained glass window for the Matea in the last 50 years or something? Yes. It, it's like a record breaking. Yes. <laughs> you, you probably tout that. You know, big windows like this, you know, glass is expensive. And they usually charge on a square foot basis. And the more figures, the more paintings, the more gestures, the more hands, up, the more it goes up. And so this is a big, big deal. But you see the same heavenly vision. Christ on the throne, surrounded by his version of the emerald rainbow with his gem-like colors, and then the saints from different places and times, all in adoration. And then you have those four-winged creatures down here that were around the throne we saw in the book of Revelation. And so you can say, oh yeah, we're one slice of the pizza, the people in the pews right now. What are the other slices of this pizza who are worshiping God? The souls in purgatory, waiting for full union with God, but they're praising God, the stars, the, the, all of creation, the saints, the angels. And so there's a much broader vision of who worships at Mass than just us. There you can see the big uh, window back there. It was a tight lock. They didn't have a big, giant uh, amount of space to put things, but they made the, the best of it, and you know, uh, successfully so. And then some of your windows there, too. These little gothic-y, bracketed things here. Is that architecture? Is that a garden? It's, it's an architectural garden that indicates the saints are in that heavenly place. And they have these gestures. Uh, where their hands are very like ballet to show they're in their heavenly glory. And you can see the stars up there and various quotes and um, the beautiful uh, root that you have there. Now, I actually, one contribution I made to this project was I'm the one who found these altars on these websites. <laughs> so they were in a closed church and they were pretty dull, right? There were three of them. And, uh, I, you know, people have their various vices with the internet. My vice is I like to look up architectural church antiques online. <laughs> And um, so I was like, hey, I then emailed somebody and said, hey, could you use these uh, in, in the project? And then it measured them and looked at them, and as a recall, there were some dealings to get them here and so on. But then they were, these two side altars were assembled from various pieces. But notice, this is nice. It's kind of dull, though, right? Wood, earthy, fine, lovely. But one of the things I was trying to suggest early on was make this heavenly. You know, they worked with a very fine painting company and a lot of discussion about how much paint to use, how much gold to use, what color to use. How do you make it look heavenly without looking like some garish Vegas, you know, uh, background? And so there's a lot of discussion about that. But see how it moves from merely earthly and lovely to have this kind of heavenly radiance. Same thing with the pulpit, which came from England. It didn't have all this paint on it, and this was added specifically to bump it up into this kind of preciousness. And then you see it, you know, when you go to these things you do here at night, you start to see the light reflecting off the gold. Even in the darkness, these things shimmer and get this kind of mystical sense. And you say, oh yeah, I'm not just liking old stuff. I'm actually having some kind of encounter with the light in the darkness, Christ destroying sin and death. Uh, the mystery is beyond, and yet I see glimmers of its fullness coming through there. And that's a real encounter, right? It's the presence of God. And the presence of God is holy and confers holiness, right? And that's what, we, that's what we all want here. Here's your old church, right? <laughs> 
not cosmos, but chaos, which is the goal. All, right, all these pieces were assembled, and they're no longer assembled, and that's what you need to do. This is the same thing. You think about the assembling of the people into the image of Christ. It's a church in Illinois under construction, and the truck dumps all these stones and bricks, and these guys put them all in place. It takes a long time. And this biblical language, you know, First Peter, you come to the living stone, but you're also living stones being built into the spiritual house. And most of us are hanging around here most of the time, but what we really want is God to send somebody. Hey, you know, I'm a focused missionary. Do you want to be in my Bible study? Hey, have you been to confession? Hey, have you heard the good news? This is the invitation to be assembled into this. There's another one, 1 Corinthians. Um, your fellow uh, workers, your God's building. I did some work at the foundation, um, but then other people will come along and help. And then when the people are there, those are the living stones. These are not living stones, but they're suggesting the fullness of that reality. And then we join in there and become members of that living stones too. So there's no division between the people as the church and the church building as the church. They're what they say mutually constitutive. It's so like having a foot and a hand and a vision in your body. It's like, no, they both make you who you are. And when a church is beautiful, it's going to reveal its ontological reality. We know ontologically it's an image of Christ, glorified, restored, angels, saints, heaven, earth, nature, and grace. And then we get to walk around in it. We get to hear the song of heaven in the choir. We get to smell the smells of heaven and flowers and incense. We get to see the sights of heaven, see the Trinity, see the new garden, see the saints, see the gems. And this is a God who loves us, right? This isn't a God who's like, hey, Adam and Eve, you blew it. You're going to have a 10,000-year time out. Go stand in the corner and you know, come back to me when you're ready to apologize. Even though we mess it up a lot of times. We want a king because the, the, they, have, they have kings. We want um, you know, prophets, but then we're going to kill them. And you're going to send your son. We're going to kill him too. God could have said, you know what? I'm tired of you guys. Like, you're gone. You're done. Instead, he said, the son that you killed will become the source of our renewal. And I'm going to let you learn what heaven is like, not with mean words and a stick, but heaven smells good, heaven looks good, heaven sounds good, <laughs> heaven tastes good. And the more you do this, the more you will be ready to be there. And that's the, the evangelical informative nature of the church building. St. Peter doesn't say, do you belong in heaven? Well, I don't know. Uh, I had one bad thought between here and earth. It's like, no, I've been, I've been doing heaven for 85 years. I'm ready. The, the, you know that tenor section? that I've, I've been in the choir rehearsal for the 85 years, and I'm ready to join that choir. And the visual and the liturgical things transform us little by little. So that it's not the angry God model. It's the or will you be happy here model. And your church upstairs here, I think, is part of transforming uh, everybody here into being happy um, in heaven as well. So congratulations to you, Father Matthias, and everybody else who's, who's done this. And I hope that you uh, see your church a little bit differently now as you go in there. So thank you very much.